Today we're going to be looking at John 8, uh, 2 through 11, and it's the story of the woman who was caught in adultery, and so we'll just throw that up there. Uh, that'll be there for your viewing. Um, this is an incredible story. It's one of the most loved stories, I think, in the book of John. And uh, I want to invite you, if you have a Bible, pull it out, because we're going to be looking at it together. Um, but you might see a little tiny note by it that says, not all the oldest manuscripts have this story, or something along those lines. Um, and uh, don't let that bother you, because this story definitely passes the duck test. You know, if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Well, this is, uh, if it sounds like Jesus, and it looks like Jesus, it's a Jesus story. So, um, it, it's the epitome of what uh, Jesus' ministry looks like in a, in a nutshell. So I'm excited to get into it with you all. And I've heard this part of the service, uh, this whole preaching thing, described as sort of a chef uh, preparing a meal. And so your pastor is the chef, and he works all week to prepare this great meal of spiritual food, and then he offers it to you for the week. And um, we're not going to do that. Uh, instead, we're going to do cooking lessons. We're going to do this together. Uh, when Christina and I were on a trip, it was pouring down rain like this. We were supposed to walk around a lake. And we go, oh, that's going to be miserable, so we're going to go saddle up in this person's house, and, and she's going to teach us how to cook, and so we got our hands dirty. And so um, what we're going to do today, together, is something called the Ignatian Method of Bible Study. Ignatius was this awesome guy in the 1400s who um, did a lot with spiritual formation. Um, frankly, it's too technical of a term, and he's really old, so I like to call this the get in their shoes method of Bible study. And what we're going to do is we're going to read through this uh, story and we're going to try to imagine it from the perspective of the various people that are in the story. And you can do this with any uh, narrative part of scripture as you kind of encounter it. Imagine what it was like to be in their shoes at that, that point and see what God brings to the surface. So we're going to do some of that together. And um, the first one that we're going to do uh, is from the perspective of the Pharisees. In the teachers of the law in the story. And um, this story, they're all going to kind of come under the umbrella of what does this say about our attitude towards other people and what does it say about our attitude towards ourselves? So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to read the passage and I want you to imagine uh, from the perspective of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law how this went down. So at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, speaking of Jesus. Um, all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, and he said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down, and he wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now, leave your life of sin. It's a great passage. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll get into this. Lord, um, thank you for the story of you, for how you uh, work with the crowd, how you work with the Pharisees, how you work with this woman, and how you work with us. Uh, teach us today as we go on this journey together. We love you. All right, so from the perspective of the Pharisees, what do you think it is that drives them? What do they care about? Um, what are they hoping for out of this whole thing? Where's their heart? Uphold the law. Uphold the law. Yeah. They want to thing. please God. Please God. Yeah. Good, Baron. Yeah. <laughs> tear down Jesus. Tear down Jesus, yeah. He's a threat to this whole thing for them. They want to maintain their power. Maintain power, yeah. Build themselves up. And build themselves up. They want to look better than her. Yeah. Feel better about themselves than her. Look down on her. Yeah. A little background. You guys really got at it. The background on Phariseeism, they, um, I think they start off with a really good intent. They, they had cataloged the scriptures in an incredible way. They had looked at all the commands of God that are in the Bible. They, they had uh, enumerated them all. There were 613 of them in the Old Testament that they had 
captured. And then along with these, they developed something called the tradition of the elders, which you can uh, encounter at various times other in the scripture. And that was sort of what the great rabbis had to say about these 613 commands and how to live them out. So like, uh, don't work on the Sabbath was one of the ones. Well, they had 34 different uh, classifications for work on the Sabbath. And then under that, they had a whole bunch more information about how far could you, say, carry a chair and it not be work? Could you push it along the ground with your legs rather than lift it up? Would that make it work? And so um, so they had watched their society kind of go through this. Uh, they had gone through the Babylonian captivity where lots of people lost track of uh, how to read the language, how to read the scriptures, how to, uh, how to live this out. And they kind of saw themselves as, we need to preserve this. We need to keep God's law before people so that they can please God, like Baron had mentioned. Um, the trick was uh, that they got a little off track in terms of how they did it. Um, they mistook themselves as the judge. And last time I checked, God was still safe on the throne doing his work and didn't need help judging. Um, but they were, they were trying to do something that was good, which was preserve what is good. And I noticed... Uh, as I kind of was praying and thinking about this, we're not in an altogether different place. We, um, many of us have gone to church for a really long time. We maybe have spent some time in the scriptures and, and we live in a, a society that doesn't always care what God has to say about various things. And it's um, various, it's very tempting for us to see ourselves as somehow better, maybe superior, or to look down on how other people are living and, and judge that and say, well, shouldn't be doing that, and they should be doing this. And um, and it's amazing how quick this judge instinct kicks in. It's, it's crazy fast. Um, I went to the gym this week. It's a very unusual occurrence, but I was excited <laughs> about it. And uh, I, I ran for almost a whole mile. It was amazing. And uh, two hours later, <laughs> two hours later. <laughs> and, and I was coming out of this gym in Mill Creek, and... Uh, in the Mill Creek Town Center, which is kind of uppity, and, and yet somehow I've lived there long enough to feel at home there, which is weird for me. And as I'm coming out, uh, this guy is coming in, and, uh, and he's a Hispanic guy, and he's just getting off of work from McDonald's. And so he's still wearing his McDonald's crew outfit. He, he has, like, uh, flour and stuff on him from what he was working on. And he's coming into the gym, and, and, and I tell you, it was so quick for me to go, what's he doing here? him belong here and I'm like what is that why like I knew nothing about this guy I did not know that he was working at McDonald's in order to support his family of five and somebody gave him the gym I, I knew nothing about this guy and it was almost like the Holy Spirit just flicked me on the ear and was like you punk what are you doing <laughs> but this kicks in so fast and it can kick on on so many levels I remember um on our second round of counseling that Christine and I went to about our marriage, by the way, I never previewed this stuff to her, so I might get in trouble here, but, um, no. but we, were, we were sitting there, and uh, I remember the counselor asking me, like, when Christina gives you a suggestion or something, do you realize that she's doing it because she's trying to help you, and she loves you, and she's rooting for you, and no, I thought it was because she was nagging me and just wanted me to do more, like, <laughs> I guess I'll be around three. We've been in every five years, and we're coming up on our 15th anniversary, so we're right on schedule. Yeah. No, but um, but it, it's funny how we can we can see a behavior, we can see something that somebody else does, and we immediately go, "Well, I know what they're trying to do, and it's probably bad." Um, and for these Pharisees, that got really, really ugly. Um, they experienced the disease that Jesus referred to as plank eye. Uh, Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5 talks, Jesus says, you know, why are you trying to take this dust out of somebody else's eye while you still have a big plank in yours? What you need to do is to get the plank out of your own eye. Then you might be able to see clearly in order to help somebody else. Um, and what that reminds me of is that we have blind spots. Anytime we start to go down the list of, of how somebody else is living and what they should be doing, um, we often don't see the spots where we aren't doing very well ourselves. We kind of ignore it, we declassify it, and we put it on somebody else, and, and it makes us into hypocrites. Um, 
Not only that, but I already kind of brought this up, but we don't know the story. We don't know where somebody has come from. Um, you ever driving and get cut off? And, and I don't know about you, but my first thought is, man, they're in such a rush and they're a dangerous driver. They probably shouldn't be on the road. My guess is they were probably texting somebody, which is something they definitely shouldn't be doing. And uh, like, what are they doing? Horrible driver, idiot. Um, and yet, when I cut somebody off, <laughs> well, could they see that I needed to get in to make that turn right there? And I had a lot on my mind, and, and I just didn't notice them there. They, they were deliberately sitting in my blind spot as I was trying to get up. Like, we totally don't know the story of what's going on with somebody. And instead, we look and we choose to judge the behavior. It's not helpful. Um, and then the last was that they had an agenda. Um, most of us, when we come uh, against something, we have some sort of agenda, uh, whether it's to feel better about ourselves or whether it's to maintain power. Um, but our motives for judging others is not always pure. Um, I had a coworker that I worked with, and, and he was probably the most difficult person I've ever run across to get along with. And uh, I get along with most people pretty well. I could not figure out how to get along with this guy. Um, and uh, I noticed myself starting to do something. I started to keep track of everything he did that was wrong or insensitive or not nice or uh, improper or... And yet every time he sort of made the effort to try to be compassionate or whatever, I go, oh, he's probably trying to just win a favor right now or... Uh, He's a jerk, or I'd write it off, or whatever. And, and I found myself keeping this list, and it was so that I could write him off, because I didn't want to get along with him. I decided he was the bad person, and I was the good person, and um, so I was looking for ammunition to, to keep him out of the same level as me. Um, so here's an alternative to that. What if we approach people with humility? We, kind of take seriously the plank guy thing and, and we realize that we have stuff going on and instead of, of judging, we ask questions and try and get at the story and get to know people. Um, I remember working at college ministry at UPC. There was a student on our student leadership and um, he was a nice guy. He seemed to love the Lord, except for when you rubbed him wrong. And then like he switched modes and would just get mean. And he would snap on people, and uh, we'd kind of clean up the mess and end up talking to the student afterwards, going, you know, he didn't really mean that. We love having you here. Please don't, like, bail on us. And, um, and I kind of went to my boss eventually, and I go, we're going to get this guy out of student council. Like, he's, he's not good on our student leadership team. And he goes, why don't you take him out for coffee and ask him about uh, how he grew up? And I was like, all right, I'll do that. So I went out for coffee with him. And as I sat there and asked him uh, about his life, I found out that he had lived in one of the most mean, abusive houses that I had ever heard of, and that he had come to the Lord about two years before. And during those two years, God had done an incredible, incredible work in this kid. And uh, he was a million miles from who he was two years ago at that point that I met him. And now as I looked at him and as I knew his story, I go, wow. He should be on student leadership because he is the perfect picture of what God can do in somebody's life. And he's a work in progress, and I'm a work in progress. So maybe I need to step back, get to know the story. Um, it's one of the things that makes it really challenging for me right now. It's a political season, it feels like, everywhere. And we talk about issues um, a lot, and uh, most of those issues don't take into account the people behind them. So we come to decisions about things rather than people. And it makes it really, really hard uh, to do this work of um, being Christians and loving people like Jesus did. So, um, all right, that's what I took away from the Pharisees. You all got at that. Now we're going to uh, take another step into somebody else's shoes. We're going to look at uh, the woman caught in adultery. So, um, imagine this uh, story as it goes down for her. Um, here we go. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them, and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. 
And they made her stand before the group, and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now, leave your life of sin. What do you think? How is this uh, for the woman? What do you think she experienced in that couple verses we just read? Why are they selling her walk? Good yeah. question. <laughs> yeah, the whole story isn't out here. He didn't show up. Yeah. He's given her healing. Public humiliation. Yeah. Regret. Regret for some choices. Public humiliation. Absolutely. They made her stand before the crowd. I know when I um, got born again and I felt so dirty inside and outside, um, when Jesus forgave me, I felt washed, clean yeah. inside and outside. It's a great description. She knew she was a law she knew what? That she was a lawbreaker. Yeah, she knew she was guilty of it. Kind of caught me at. I wonder if she was afraid because she thought Jesus would stop him, and instead he said, "Okay, go ahead and throw him." And so she was kind of waiting to see who yeah. was going to hit her first, see which rock was coming. Betrayed, maybe. Because, yeah. you know, you have to set up catching someone in adultery. Yeah, early morning, caught in adultery, in the act. Peek in the window at this time. The guy didn't show up. This was totally a setup. Um, she was trapped by authorities. Yeah. She was totally trapped. She's totally trapped. She didn't have a way out. And this was totally not even about her. This was a way to take down Jesus. It was discredit him as a teacher or get him to encourage a stoning either way. He's out. Um, by the way, that uh, encouraging the stoning thing, the Romans didn't allow people to get killed by anyone but themselves under their rule. And so had Jesus said, stoner, Jesus, the next stop would have been taking Jesus to the authorities to get crucified by them. So, um, As I process this, um, I kind of got the same thing. She's a victim. She was set up. Uh, but she was guilty. I mean, she has some decisions that she's probably ashamed of, and now those that shame is public, uh, which is even harder. She's trapped. Um, there's a really powerful word that this passage uses, um, and it's the same word I think that we sometimes feel when we come face to face with our um, downfalls, our shortcomings, our sin, um, our brokenness. And that word um, is condemned. It's an incredibly strong, powerful <coughs> word. Condemned. Uh, we use it for buildings. Building is condemned when it's considered completely useless, has no hope or, or purpose mm -hmm. or future. That's that's condemned. Um, or somebody who gets a sentence, uh, they they're condemned. <coughs> I looked it up in the dictionary, and it's even like limited and trapped where you are. So uh, his lack of experience in education condemned him to only entry level. Um, but it, it's stuck. It is not. It has no future. It's a dead end. And um, I think sometimes uh, sin kind of feels like that to us. Uh, the Bible describes the devil as the accuser. It's one who accuses us, and, and what he wants more than anything is for us to not recognize the grace of God in our life, not recognize the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And decide you're condemned. You're stuck. You're caught. You're sin. Um, Read the story this week. Walter McMillan, um, 1986, he was uh, charged with uh, killing an 18-year-old girl. 
And uh, this was in the deep south, and um, three white witnesses said that they saw him there, and six African-American witnesses from his church said that he wasn't there, and he was with them uh, at a church function. Um, the court, uh, the jury decided that he was guilty, and he was put on death row, 1986. And um, he was there until 1993, and during that time, seven years, he saw eight executions. And he was kind of getting moved down the south towards that spot. And then finally, a lawyer heard about his case and um, brought it before the courts, appealed it, had it tried somewhere else besides the south, and um, he was exonerated. He had always claimed his innocence. Um, and the crazy thing was, when the lawyer would visit him afterwards, uh, visit him in his home after he'd been set free, uh, he would always ask him, how's the case coming? Uh, you got to get me off death row, man. I didn't do this. He'd always say that. And it was almost like, despite that he was set free, despite the fact that he had a brand new life ahead of him, he still felt trapped, stuck. And um, that is exactly what we do when we stay wrapped up in our past. When we do not accept the grace of God in our life to say, you're forgiven, you have a new life, go live it. Exactly what he said to this woman. Um, when we say, well, no, there's this and this about me, and there's that that I did, I should feel guilty before God always because of it. Um, we just stay trapped. We stay stuck, just like Walter was, um, despite the fact that we have a new life. And the funny thing is, we just prayed that prayer that the Lord taught us, and he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those uh, who are in debt against us. Um, Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. There's a link there, and we don't really get the grace of God, I don't think, unless we figure out how to extend it. Uh, I had a hard time with my stepmom when I was a young teenager, a really, really hard time. And ten years later, um, I was sitting there at, with a friend of mine at Bible school, and, and he said to me, does it bother your stepmom that you don't forgive her? <laughs> I thought, probably not. I think she's moved on like eight years ago now. Uh, he goes, well, you're still pretty angry about it. It seems to bother you. Um, so what's your unforgiveness doing? And, and it, it was there that kind of began a, a five-month process of me figuring out how to forgive my stuff. Um, and through it, I was set free. And, and I think that's what God wants to do. He wants to set us free to live a new life. And um, <clears throat> it's good for us to recognize that we're lawbreakers and that we're saved by grace. Uh, but I worry sometimes when we don't recognize that we're given a new life and it's time to move into it. And that's the gift of God. All right, uh, how are we doing on time? We're going to skip the crap. Another Bible study, perhaps. Um, we're going to read this from the perspective of Jesus. And for this one, uh, if you could push the slide forward one, that'd be fun. We're going to look at the, our piece once again. Uh, flipped over. <coughs> it's kind of fun, Jesus is in there, so... That was my discovery of the week for art. Um, all right, from the perspective of Jesus, here we go. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now, leave your life of sin. Being Jesus, hard to do? What would you experience? What do you think? What was it like for him in this story? Incredibly calm. Yeah. 
Writing in the dirt. No. Love that about Jesus. He seems to know what to do. Calm. Very neutral too. Yeah. He left the decision in everybody's hands. A woman. Actually not protecting himself as well. Yeah. Why does he do that? Like he's going right out. He kind of saved everybody. <clears throat> including himself. He was yeah. the only one who was without sin. Was he the only one who had the authority to condemn us? Yeah. He chose not to. Yep. He, he didn't try to argue his point or in, or uh, stand up for himself. He just <clears throat> let truth kind of reveal itself. Yeah. That truth moves really forward. This one is the best, best for me. I loved, um, I want Jesus to jump up and get in the face of the Pharisees and go, look at you guys. You're coming down on this lady for this, and yet you are trying to commit murder right now, and you're getting this whole crowd involved in committing a murder. You got this lynch mob all stirred up, and you're trying to get rid of me, even though I'm teaching the I want him to do that. Um, but he doesn't. He sort of calmly writes in the sand, takes a breath, lets everyone catch their heads a little bit. Uh, Catch their their perspective again. Um, he doesn't ever condone the woman, and yet he invites her into something new. He saves the crowd from a murder. Uh, and what Robert said is really really powerful. Uh, if the one who has the right to condemn. Jesus, the sinless one, the only one who can actually judge anybody, chooses to save rather than condemn. Wow. What does that leave for us to do? And then this woman, go and sin no more. He kind of lets her decide what's next. He just says, I'm not going to condemn you. What do you want to do next? And, and maybe that's what it means to be a Christian. Maybe that can be our attitude and our action is um, when we come across something is to, to say, well, if God doesn't condemn it, then neither will I. So how do I show grace and love and um, tell this person I'm not going to condemn them and invite them into something different and better? Learn a lot about that, by the way, on Wednesday morning from the guys that we meet with. They're slowing me down and, and writing in the sand a little bit and making me ask questions instead of jump to judgments. But I think it's a beautiful model. Love people for who they are and no matter what they've done, and remember that uh, they're not condemned. Therefore, we can hope for them. We can believe for them. We can trust God for them, that God is at work in them just like he's at work in you and me. And that we're all going to move forward together and um, and invite him. He doesn't say, you know, I set you free now. You can go back to whatever it was you were doing. He says, I'm not going to condemn you. Go. Sin no more. We have something to give to people. That's, that's maybe what it means to be a Christian in a society that doesn't care that much about what the Bible says or what God says is we have something to offer. Um, a different sort of way of life. If you want to be a part of it, there's always a part of that. Um, so let's be people who care deeply about what God says. Start with ourselves, do it with humility, and then love people into it. Let's be people who receive God's forgiveness and grace for ourselves so that we don't stay trapped and stuck and condemned. And instead, we move into what it means to be empowered by the Holy Spirit for a new life. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Let's pray. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you love us enough not to condemn us, that you love us so much that you would go to the cross for us. And thank you that you care about us so much that you don't want to see us condemned, but would rather see us walk into abundant life. Lord, help us to, with humility, extend that gift to those around us. Help us be people who care and who hope and who ask questions and who walk with people well. You are so good, and you are so steady with us. Help us to be that with others. We love you.